Hey there, Liverpool family. This is your pastor, Wayne Wagner. This is week three of our series that we're calling Change, ultimately trying to change our mind about some things that Jesus has taught us through his word. In week one, we talked about changing our attitude, especially changing our attitude when it comes to money. We learned and, and hopefully we have changed our attitude and realized that we are just the managers of the things that God has given us. We are the managers of the finances that God has blessed us with. And we, we looked hard into that passage saying that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And so step one in changing our mind concerning finances has everything to do with realizing who owns it in the first place. It's not us, it is God, and God gives us that stuff to manage. In the second week, Josh Hazard spoke and talked about laying up treasures in heaven to change our treasure from things on earth and switching from, from a very temporary perspective into an eternal perspective. This is the third week. This is the final week of our series, Change, and we got some stuff to get into. Now, I have always been the kind of guy who liked to have some sort of mission or some sort of adventure to do in my life. When I was very young, I had a, I had a whole bunch of these, these little green army guys, and I, they're always so fun to me to play with. And I would set up all these scenarios out. I would go find a spot in the woods, and I would set up scenarios where these guys who were all wearing the same uniform somehow were fighting each other. I don't know why they were doing that. And I would set all that stuff up and I would create these scenarios and these missions. And then somehow in the middle of that, you know, He-Man would show up or the Incredible Hulk would arrive in a spaceship. And uh, I, I always used this little helicopter, which is just a fun little army helicopter. I love it. It's actually from 1976, the year I was born. And I would take that stuff out into the woods and I would do all sorts of missions and have all kinds of fun with it. Uh, I used to also ride skateboards and we had these missions where we're going to make a ramp and it's going to be so scary, but we're going to jump it and it's going to be awesome. And I even have evidence of that if you doubted it. Uh, just look at that dude. That dude is awesome. And you have to you have to know that at least part of what we were doing is because chicks were watching. But we had this mission. We were going to build a ramp and do something awesome with it. And it was always fun. When I was in college, I invented something called conquering. And the whole idea of conquering was to scale the outside of a department store or a grocery store, get on top of the building, look around, be stupid, throw rocks, whatever we were doing. And we called it conquering. It was our mission to conquer that. And even today, as a 44-year-old, golf is kind of like a mission for me. You know, I want to go out and I want to play a good round. I want to shoot a good score. And, and so I have this mission every time I go and do it. I think a, a lot of us, we really like the idea of a mission or, a, or missions in our life because it gives us an opportunity to be successful. It gives us an opportunity to try something, to join forces with other people. A mission helps us get a thing accomplished, but without a mission, life can be pretty bland and pretty boring. We wake up every day in the same bed, go to the kitchen, drink the same coffee, get in the same car, go to the same job, come back home, watch the same TV shows over and over again, and then get back in the same bed and then repeat, repeat, repeat. And I don't know about you, but without a mission, that sounds like a soul deadening existence. But if you are a follower of Jesus, your mission is exactly like Jesus' mission, who Jesus, when he came, he said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. That was his mission. He came to this earth to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, he's not talking about his car keys. He's talking about us. He came to provide a way for lost people to find him, to be saved, and that's what Jesus came to do. And before Jesus went back up into heaven, before he ascended, he left instructions for us concerning our mission when he said, Go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, in that sense, our mission and the mission Jesus had are exactly the same. Our lives are about bringing people to Jesus. That is our mission. Our mission is to bring people to Jesus. But have you ever thought about why? 
Why is it our mission? Why is it our responsibility? Why is it something that we need to do? Why do we need to be the ones to bring people to Jesus? Well, there's some answer for that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It says, For we are God's handiwork, meaning that God has made us. We are God's handiwork. We are a product of His workshop. We were created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So from the very beginning of our creation, God has made us with a purpose, with an explicit purpose to do good works. That means that we have a mission like Jesus to bring lost people, to bring people to God, we were created with this mission. It is sewn into our DNA, and it's why mission matters so much to us. It's why so many of us have an innate desire to do something and to accomplish something. But you might be asking yourself, how does this relate to money? Well, that's a great question. And obviously, we've been talking a lot about money, and today is going to be no different. Money is a crucial topic for us to discuss. And since we know that it's not ours, and we know that treasure in heaven is lasting, it should change how we do what we do with our money while we are here. Everything that we have learned in this series should lead us to one final thought, that we need to change our mission. We, as followers of Jesus, we need to change our mission, especially when it comes to finances. Now, obviously, the church needs money to continue with the operations of the building, but also Liverpool Christian Church and the church abroad, we use money to spread the gospel of Jesus. And specifically here, we use money to spread the gospel to the Dominican Republic. If as a church, we did not give financially, this couldn't continue. Also, this place couldn't continue. This church couldn't continue. We would effectively have to stop giving people counseling or taking people groceries when they need groceries or guiding people in the ways of God or in the word of God. A lot of these things would have to stop if as a church, we did not give money. The Dominican Republic food uh, giveaways would cease. There's a lot of things that would cease if we stopped or if we ceased giving financially to LCC. If the church stops giving, there are people who will never know about the love of Jesus. And so as part of our mission concerning money, it has to do with keeping LCC on the move. Another part of that or the other side of that is if we don't change our mission concerning our personal finances, then our personal lives can easily become stressed out, overextended, and debt-ridden. Is that good? I mean, honestly, burnt out, stressed out, overextended, debt-ridden. If we don't change our mission when it comes to our personal finances, that's where we're going to end up. So money, both in the church and in your personal fi finances, it helps make the mission possible. It helps make LCC's mission possible. It helps make God's mission possible on this earth. Now, obviously money is not the only thing, but it is certainly a weapon that we can use while we are on mission. So let's get into our passage today. It comes from 1 Timothy chapter 6, and here's the first part of verse 17. He says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth. Now, it is at this point we go, command those who are rich. It is at that point when we get to the word rich where we kind of check out. A lot of us will check out because we hear that word and we immediately think, well, this doesn't apply to me because I'm not rich. But the word rich is an interesting term because it's a sliding scale sort of word. Uh, if someone makes $50,000 a year, the person they think the person who makes seventy five thousand is rich, and the person who makes seventy five thinks the person that makes one twenty five is rich, and the person that makes one twenty five thinks that the person who makes three million dollars is rich. Okay, so it's a sliding scale, and chances are, if your last name isn't Bezos or Buffett, you think you're not rich. Well, let me put that into perspective to you uh, for you for just a bit. 
If you make $9,000 a year, a minimum of $9,000 a year, that puts you in the top 8% of wage earners in the world. $9,000, which is about 175 bucks a week. If you only make 175 bucks a week or about $9,000, you are richer than 92% of the world. You might also be rich if you own a car. And some of us are so rich that we own a room where our car sleeps. And some of us are so rich that we can fill up that car with fuel so that we can drive around and do nothing. Some of us are so rich we have grass for no reason other than aesthetics. And some of us are so rich that we have animals living in our home that we buy food for, that we give water to, that provide nothing back for us. We have animals in our life that provide neither milk nor meat, and they are simply accessories in our life. We are a rich, rich people. And so we cannot ignore this passage because we think we aren't rich. If we put it into perspective, 9,000 bucks makes us richer than 92% of the rest of the world. So we have to pay attention. Don't tune out when you see the word rich just because you think, well, I'm not rich. So let's finish the passage. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain I mean, come on, y'all. Wealth is so uncertain. We can, if we put our hope in something that is un, that sucks. We're in a terrible position if we do that. Don't put your hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. But to put their hope in God, okay, well, that makes sense. God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. We can't be arrogant about our wealth. We can't be arrogant about the things that we have. God has provided those things for us. Why would we be arrogant about something that we didn't even provide for ourselves? God is giving us these things and we cannot put our hope in things that are so temporary and so shifting. He goes on in verse 18, command them to do good. You can always say that with me. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. All right, rich people, this is what rich people do. We're supposed to do good. We're supposed to do good deeds, supposed to be generous, supposed to be willing to share. And if you make $9,000 a year, you are wealthier than 92% of the world. So rich people, us, you and me, we are meant to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous, to be willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation, not a fleeting one, not one that's going to fade away, but as a firm foundation for the coming age, meaning heaven or life after this life, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Life that is truly life is not temporary. It is not uncertain like money is. So we have to change our mission when it comes to money. And according to this passage, our mission when it comes to money is to do good deeds, to be generous, and to be willing to share. We have to change our mission if we're going to follow God's plan for our finances. Now, God's mission for all of us is that we would be generous, that we would be generous with the finances that he has given us. Being generous becomes much easier when we realize what we talked about in the first two weeks, that it's all God's anyway, and that when we're generous, we're laying up treasure in heaven. So I want to give you three priorities for your generosity. Just three things, three places where you can be generous. In case you're wondering if where that is, uh, I'm going to clear that up for you right now. Three places where your generosity should be received first. First place is this, your church. The first place that we should be generous is our church. Our church, Liverpool Christian Church, should be your first priority with the money that you have, with the generosity that you're going to display. God says in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Now, it, tithe is one of these biblical words that we don't use a lot in our society, but it just means 10%. 
10% of your income, 10% of your paycheck. That first 10% is meant to be dedicated to the Lord. And also, if we look at Proverbs 3.10, which we talked about in the first week of the series, we are meant to bring in our first fruits, the first fruits of our harvest, or the first fruits of our paycheck, or the first 10%, or the tithe of our paycheck. This is our first place of priority to bring that 10%, to bring that tithe into the storehouse. We should make it our mission to give 10% of what we earn to the church. Now, I want to be very clear. God does not need your money. This is not about God, you know, with his hand out and shuffling along with the pan, trying to collect whatever he's trying to collect. Us giving our 10% to God is about us surrendering to Him. It is about us putting Him first in our life, making Him number one in our life. And it is not because He needs it. We give 10% to God because we need that. We need to know. We need to prove to ourselves that He is number one in our life. And we need to trust Him when we give our 10%. We trust Him for the rest, that He will take care of the rest. As a disciple of Jesus, as a follower of Jesus, our entire goal, our entire life should be about surrendering ourselves to Jesus. And I'll say this, and I mean this because this is going to be tough. Money is often the toughest thing for people to surrender. It's often the toughest thing for someone who is a follower of Jesus to surrender generally the last stronghold. And so if we're going to be people who are going to trust in God, tithing is a hill that we're going to have to conquer. Maybe my little army man can help you with that. And if not, we'll bring in the reinforcements with the helicopter. All right. So the first place that we want to be generous or the first priority for our generosity is the church. The second place or the second priority for your generosity is your people. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means the people in your church. Your first priority is the church overall. Your second priority is the people in the church. Look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. As we have opportunity, all right, meaning if you can help, help. All right, if you have opportunity to help, if you have what you need and you can help, help. As we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, everybody in the whole world, but especially especially to those who belong to the family of believers. That means the people in your church. So our first priority is the church overall. The second priority is the people in the church. This is not to the exclusion of those outside the church, but it means that we would take care of one another first. We cannot take care of people outside of the walls if we haven't taken care of the people inside of our walls, especially because we are supposed to take care of the people who are belonging to the family of believers. We, we would at home, you would make sure that your family is fed before you go and feed another family. Now, it may sound cruel and it may sound selfish or weird, but the fact remains if the people inside of your family aren't taken care of, then it's nearly impossible to take care of people outside of your family. It's like if you ask someone, uh, hey, where's your son? And they go, oh, Dylan, he's lying in a ditch, half dead somewhere, but I'm here to take care of your kid. You've been completely ignoring your own child, your own Dylan, to take care of someone else's kid when, when the reality is, as a church, as followers, as the body of Christ, which we are, we are meant to take care of each other. The church is a body of believers and we belong to each other, which means that it is a priority for our generosity to take care of your people here in this church. We are a body. We are a family. And when one of our family is suffering or in need, we have a responsibility to take care of that part of the body. So when it comes to our generosity and these three priorities, the first one is your church, church here. The second is your people. And the third, and, and this is a guideline, but the third one is your cause. What causes 
pull at your heartstring? What tugs at your heart? What thing or subject or problem or issue or social injustice do you see that you think, man, I can do something about that. I can donate to that thing. I can be generous to that thing. Ask yourself these questions. What, what pulls at my heartstrings? What organizations do I believe in? And then make a decision to be generous with them. I often think about Vera House, who helps women who have been sexually assaulted and, and those who are in domestic abuse situations. I also think about the folks that are milling around outside of the rescue mission. I know that Josh and Amber, uh, our children's minister and one of our elders, they support Hillside, which does everything it can to get kids adopted into families that will love them and take care of them. And Kimber, our youth minister, and her husband Andy, they support an organization called Love 146, and their entire goal is to stop sex trafficking. I mean, these are huge, big things, and they pull on all of our heartstrings. And so what we do is we're generous with those things. We support our church. Obviously, that's the first thing. That's what God asks of us. We support our people, the people inside the church, and then we support our cause. When you feel compelled to support something, and after you followed the first two basic biblical principles, being generous with your cause is just another way to show that you care about something. Now, here's a really important Bible passage when you're considering your levels of generosity. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul, uh, Paul wrote this, Each one of you should give what you have what? Decided. Each one of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We are on a mission to be generous, but that mission should never be done in a begrudging manner. We should be cheerful when we are able to be generous with the people that we have been called and pushed to be generous to. This is meant to be a joyful experience. And if it is not a joyful experience for you, then maybe you have to ask yourself, why are you giving in the first place? I mean, do you want to be generous? Are you compelled by a desire for generosity? Or is it maybe because of guilt? One of these ways is awesome and the other one is not. Can you guess which one it is? Definitely. God loves a cheerful giver, not one, not our giving that comes reluctantly or under compulsion. And so this is the mission when it comes to our finances. Set aside a certain amount of money earmarked for generosity. This is all about changing our mission when it comes to finances. And if we're going to change our mission when it comes to finances, then ultimately we're going to have to step out on faith. We're going to have to take a step. We're going to have to, maybe some of us are going to have to take a leap. Some of us are going to have to throw caution to the wind and take this step of faith. Now, understand it is not faith in the money. It is not faith in yourself. It is only faith in God. It is only surrender to God. It is only us saying, God, I'm going to give you this because I trust you to take care of me for the rest. What if we, as a church, and what if we, as followers of Jesus, decided to take that step of faith on this journey toward generosity? What if you decided to be generous? What if you made that decision? What if you decided to change your mission when it came to finances? If we did that, man, I can picture a beautiful scenario where our core as a church to love God, love others, and serve the world would become so much more than a slogan and so much more than a cool graphic in the back of the auditorium. It would become how we live. It would become our flesh and blood, and it would be beautiful. If we changed our mission to be generous, love God, love others, and serve the world, 
is no longer a pithy statement, which is biblically true, by the way. But it is real, and it becomes real in our hearts and our lives, and it becomes a practice in our world, which means that we have changed our mission, and we are surrendering more and more of ourselves in faith to Jesus. I want to give you a challenge. Make whatever decisions you need to make to be generous, starting with your church, starting with the people in your church, and then moving on to the cause that you believe in the most. Let's be people who change our mission, and let's be people who are generous with what God has given us. God has given us so much. He gave actually his son, Jesus, so that we could be saved from our sins, so that our sins could be forgiven, so that we can avoid an eternity that is devoid of hope. God gave his son and Jesus gave his life. They were extremely generous with that. Every week as a practice at this church, we participate in something called communion, where we take a cracker and a little cup of juice, and we take that cracker to remember the body of Jesus sacrificed for us, and we take that juice to remember the blood of Jesus, which washes our sins. My encouragement for you is to do that right now. Go into the kitchen, grab a cracker, grab some juice, take a moment and pray and thank God for the generous gift of his son so that we can be set free from the sin that can so easily entangle us. Let's do that now. Let's be people who change our mission. Let's be people who are generous, generous like our Savior. Thank you so much for joining us. Hope you have a great day.